stuff from uh, the influencer, you know, the elite, the, the stuff that I wasn't really touching them very much, but I, every time I listen to some of that, I learned quite a bit. Right? There's a lot of uh, organizations back then engineering us, engineering us to a fuel invaded. Engineered. Yeah, you look a little engineered. I look mm. a little engineered. Mm. Invaded. Engineering us. Why, America? I was too arrogant, I was too full of shit, and I just didn't want, I wasn't going to get a sponsor, I wasn't going to do service work, I certainly wasn't going to do the steps, and I was not going to do God. Okay guys, welcome back to the America Show. We are going to be chatting with Dave Smith a little bit later uh, about Buddhist recovery centers and recovery and addiction and all sorts of fun stuff. Well, not real fun, I guess. It's a bad descriptor for this one, but... It was enlightening. Enlightening. When I was doing the show notes, I kind of changed it. I went from fun and then I changed it to enlightening. To enlightening. Yeah, I don't want to call it fun. It was a good chat, though. First, as always, Grandmom Spaghetti Dunlop. How's it going, buddy? No regretty. How you doing? (laughs) Good. Good. Pretty good, yeah. I'm I'm pretty pumped, actually, because we had a really, really good pot. Like, one of those nights the other night where we, we had, like, three interviews lined up. And uh, it was just one of those nights that made me realize, like, why we're doing this, because we had just great chats with super interesting people and some real rare, rare chats about very, very intriguing stuff, you know? Yeah, some good ones for sure coming your way. Like unique, unique. We rec- we started recording a lot more doubles when we're on recording night, so I guess we're just going to start probably dumping extra... F- episodes out we'll probably end up doing like five a month or something it seems like yeah and then we also have the extra black budget Plus we feed. Have the black so, budget feed so, so you're talking about extra in the normal feed really. i'm talking about extra in the normal feed just extra interviews we're just stepping it up um you know yeah we want to interview too many people there's too many people there's an, a the a list that's even growing faster than I can imagine four yeah. years, four and a half years into this and it's growing. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to start releasing extra, but more episodes. We're going to go from probably four a month to five a month. Plus the black budget. Plus feed, the black so. budget feed. And that's so the best way to support, support the show. Now's yeah. the time. Yeah. Cause you're about to start getting a bunch more everything. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have a black budget episode out soon, right? In the extra feed, it'll be one on Disney, I think. Or no, yeah, what, we've what got one on? coming Disney? out. We've yeah. got one coming out on all a bunch of Disney symbology and hidden stuff and things like that, uh, which sounds like it's going to be great. We're recording it this weekend, so that'll come out probably early next week. And then uh, another week or so, Psilocybus 2 will drop. Enter the mushroom again, yep. Yeah. So it's a little more lighthearted. Yep. Last one's pretty lighthearted, too. But uh, it's pretty good, and I think you guys will enjoy it once the Grom Steak's done editing it for me. Yep. There's like five hours of shit to whittle down. Can we talk a little bit about the logistics around the the support? Sure. So people, if if you click on, well, it's in the show notes as well, but if you go to www.gramerica.ca slash support and choose any option, like a one-time donation or a monthly Darren will email you daily. So every day he sends out an email to people who have done this. Not every day, but whenever it happens. Man, we do it manually. That's right. And you copy and paste that. That's an RSS feed, not a regular link. So you need to copy and paste it into your podcast player under the add a new podcast. And then it'll automatically aggregate all the new episodes. If you're not using a podcast player, then you need to go through the support page, if you go to the support page, there's a link. And so if I email you that that RSS feed and you're not going to use it, just email me back and ask for the password. It'll give yeah. you the password to the password protected website and everything's on there as well. Oh, I see what you mean. So that's a backup, a backup way for people that don't use podcast players, really. 
Yeah, the YouTube people, and there is actually more people than I thought that are, aren't that, using the that, podcast. That listen by the website or by YouTube or whatever, yeah. That's okay. right. We could definitely use some more support, though. I was running the numbers the other day. I think we're still we're still hovering around 1% yeah. for support. It'd be nice to yeah. see that number hit like two. His other shows are doing a 10. Some shows are doing 10. Those are the people that hold back, though. We don't hold any content back from you guys. So. Yeah, exactly. We just hold it that you guys can find it in your hearts that you find a little value from the show and you throw a little value back our way. Yeah, we want to do it without ads and we don't, you know, we don't have, we do have expenses here, fixed expenses. I mean, the support has really helped because yeah. it's, it's helped pay off the debt that we put into this. To, to Plus for, we're able to start doing some interesting things like really yeah. try doing the little video presentation with Matheson that's on Ooh, the YouTube yeah, that's channel coming out. That'll be an extra piece coming out. Well, it's already on the YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. So people yeah, can but, check it out now if they want to watch the YouTube. We're going to release it as bonus audio right away. Yeah. But you can see it on the YouTube channel where we pull up all the star maps constellations and, stuff. and things like that. So that's all so stuff that we would have never got to if we wouldn't have had support at some level. Yeah. But that level's still really low compared to other paywall things. I mean, we get that the value for value model was always going to be a little bit lower because we're not yeah. really selling you anything. I guess yeah. we do have the black budget apps now. But anyway, if you can. You know, check out grammarica.ca slash support and see if there's anything there that works for you. And if there's not, of course, you know, the the stuff that you can, there's a bunch of stuff you can do that's free. And that's, I mean, there's no excuse for not doing that thing. If you've listened to like 50 episodes of the show and you haven't reviewed it, shared it, and rated it. And we know it's a tough thing to share because yeah. a lot of the stuff we talk about is pretty controversial yeah. and personal and spiritual right. or whatever so share but if, still. You, if you should sign up for somebody you should assign somebody it should be signed up for the newsletter review the show and share the show yep and oh by the way now you can share the show a little easier because the app's out oh geez I've been getting a bunch of, yeah I've been getting a bunch of shit because the Android app's not out yet but that's in production it should be out in about two or three weeks they're telling me of course they told me that about the they told me that about the other app too and it took like six months Seemed like anyway, yeah. but it's out now. So you just search Grammarica in the app store. So if you've got someone that has a phone, but they don't know how to do the whole podcast thing and oh, listening yeah, to the website yeah. is hard. And even the YouTube thing can get tough. Now you can just go in the app store, search Grammarica, download the app on their phone or their iPad, and they'll get every ep- new episode of the show just as well. And it presents the artwork really well too. It's all good. Yeah. yeah. And of course that's more money. That's more money that comes out of the show comes out of our pockets yeah that costs us a couple, a couple hundred bucks a year yeah. for that plus, plus the development plus the costs development and everything costs else and stuff. So. so yeah support the show guys go america.ca slash support we'll stop yapping now about that thanks we'll get into something else thanks big thanks to the people that do we, we definitely don't want to undermine the oh, people and you, that you are can also, supporting the show you can also email us I mean we wanted to talk about that as well spamgram g-r-a-h-a-m at grammarica.com and uh, people send in their stories and trip reports and experiences and feedback, and it's great. I like to connect with the listeners and read this stuff in an intro before our interviews. Word up. We have a timestamp uh, in the show notes as well, so if you don't want to listen to this jibber-jabber, then you can just fast-forward to the interview. Usually we talk for 20 minutes to 45 minutes or something like that, just Get the get the listeners involved. So I got some... Uh, some appropriate for this chat with Dave Smith on recovery and a lot. I've got some sort of bad trip reports and also some recovery stories from listeners that I've been sort of accumulating. Accumulating? Yeah. Huh. And I got a couple synchronicities as well. If we want to get into that or we can. What we do can, you want to uh, start with? Well, I don't know. Let's get into, uh, let's get into the trip. Uh, let's get into the, the, uh, Come on, spit it the, out. the recovery email. And it's kind of a bit of a trip report as well and sightings and stuff. He talks talks about a lot of stuff on there. I don't know if I have a recovery email jingle. No, no, just do like the uh, spam gram or something. And now another edition of Grime American Goodies by the people. All the people. That's another way to support the show. You can send a jingle in. Oh, did you get that? There's been people actually sending new jingles in. Oh, uh, they've been coming in like crazy, yeah. That's actually more of a song, that one. Oh, is it? Okay. The songs are starting to come in. Oh, right. <laughs> they always pick you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, that's because you're one of the best interviewers in the world, and I'm just a dope. <laughs> oh, you got that one. Yeah. I, I didn't afford you that one. Yeah, you did. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> He was kidding. Yeah, we'll see how long fucking Joe Brick has to wait for his stickers. <laughs> he was kidding. I know he was. <laughs> so, so this is from uh, MK Ultra, actually. And that's oh, we his, should that's mention that. He wanted a big MK. thanks to Joe. Big shout out to Joe Brick for the donation. Oh, he says you did, you're not supposed to read his name on the air. No, he said to say his name. I think he said don't he said, say don't his name. Don't worry about saying oh. it because it might get his co-workers to donate yeah step it up yeah, co-workers so, yeah thanks joe joe is now king of the group <laughs> and he'll so he's head grand american for in charge helmet or whatever. so on all grand american related related matters on that work uh, friend crew yep i have to say that joe's uh joe's a man he's he's his opinion is you know he's probably right He's probably right. <laughs> yeah. If you guys are disagreeing, Joe's probably right. If not, he's pretty curious. Yeah. It could be. Okay, so here I we go. This is, from, this is from... Go, Joe. This is from MK. Hey, Graham. I recently started listening to this podcast, and it has been amazing. I've only listened to a few podcasts in the past, and even that was rare. I listened to Spotify. Oh, you know what? Just before I forget, if you're emailing us or even contacting us on sh- social media, it's good to know how you find the podcast. That's our only marketing research is actually hearing it from you guys. Besides the, you know, some stats that give us some, some like information. To know what your but, favorite show is, how you found the show, and what the worst show was. No, I mean, to, to, you don't have to get into that many details. Just how you, just how you found us okay. is good. That helps. All right. So he says, uh, I listen to Spotify, and you guys were recommended. Spotify knows me too well. As soon as I saw the Moai with the dube in his mouth, I thought, damn, this is for me. I only started listening a couple of weeks ago, but I'm already on episode 100. I listened what? to... Did he start at one? I don't know. Maybe. I don't know how people can go all the way up. Like how do that, they even but... know it's 100? They're not numbered. I think we started at 100, didn't we? I don't know. The new anyways. iTunes update is killing me. Any, really? I'm trying to get the show to look right. Uh, anyways, uh, it would be interesting that if people do listen it in, in uh, chronological order like that, it would be interesting to see how we've changed and hopefully we're changing for the better because you're kind of out of the loop and disconnected when you're looking back. Why don't you just go back and listen to the first couple me? of weeks? Yeah. No, are you kidding? I don't have time to even research the guest's content. I don't ever listen to these shows. No? No. No, me either. I listened to Ep 234 first. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Since it was the newest at that time and was just blown away. I had to start from the beginning. Oh, see, I should have just kept reading. Ephraim Palermo. <laughs> I recently sat myself... Oh, I recently sent myself to treatment for alcohol despondency. Or dependency. I think I could get that right. And I couldn't believe when you agreed with one of your guests about being an old 12-stepper. It was the first of a thousand things that has drawn me closer and closer to you in the show. I was, am, a drug addict for the past 20 years, and I'm 30 now with a wife and children, and treatment taught me something very important. A spiritual experience is key to life. Having had that, and being clean and sober for the first time in my life, I didn't know how to put all the pieces of experience together. This show and its guests are helping me do that every day. As far as sightings and or encounters go, I've never personally seen or encountered, but I don't not believe. I was working an outdoor remodel project with my old company and had to leave to pick up my daughter. When I got back, my two partners were acting very weird. I had my daughter with me and I thought they were pissed that I had to leave and that I wouldn't be working for the rest of the day. However, the next day they explained that they didn't want to scare my daughter. They had seen something. In the middle of the day in Wichita, Kansas, they explained it wasn't so much an object with three glowing orbs on the corners as much as a lack of an object. It slowly got closer and closer, and at one point all three orbs separated and went flying off in a different direction. I didn't see, so I can't explain it all that well. But like I said, I don't not believe. Having been a heroin junkie in the past, I've had numerous NDEs, a bit too much for me to get into, but they do do have a lasting effect. Also, I just got past your first lucid dreaming episode. 
I never knew what I was doing. For the past few years, due to alcohol, I haven't been dreaming. But sobriety has changed that, and not only am I dreaming again, thanks to this show, I'm wildly lucid dreaming. As a brother in recovery, I'm sure you understand the flood of using dreams you get once you get sober. Well, last night was the first time I had a lucid using dream, and I could deny myself the drugs and alcohol. I woke up crying. I didn't know how powerful that could be. Well, hang in there, buddy. You still get, uh, this is me now. You still get using dreams after like almost Are you going to read your ears? What? No, I'm just or talking just to you now. Know, you I'm just explaining that the using dreams keep going, but they're not, they're not like, they're good dreams because, you know, it does make you realize that it's, I don't get it's, using dreams. You don't dream, really. You don't remember I don't them. remember them. Yeah. Maybe I'm just dreaming just, about sniff and blow like crazy and no. I just don't remember. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe you should just go abstinent for a week off of the, the ganja and you'd start dreaming. Maybe. Yeah. Let's try it. Experiment. I really want to dream that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Dreaming's not that important. <laughs> I could use the rest. This last bit is an OBE slash psychedelic experience. About 10 years ago, I was living in an apartment in Dallas, just south of the airport. A couple of friends and I decided to take some LSD, mushrooms, and MDMA. I always like to go a little further out than anyone else. So I took, oh my God. So I took three hits of acid, ate five grams of mushrooms, and took a half a gram of MDMA. It was an amazing night. The fog was so thick, we were sitting outside listening to the planes land at the airport, but you couldn't even see the lights. At around 10 in the a.m., we had mostly come down and decided to go eat at Waffle House. About halfway through the meal, I felt absolutely sick and had to go outside immediately. I could see the fog had begun to lift, and as I leaned against the wall and slid down, and as soon as my ass hit the concrete, I was rocketed up into the sky. I was circling like a bird looking down at the Waffle House. I could even I could even see myself sitting on the ground through a break in the fog. I noticed a black SUV pulling into the parking lot and people getting out. As soon as the first person closed their door, the sound whooshed me back into my body and parked in the parking lot was the black SUV and all the people I had seen getting out. Now, mind you, I thought I had hallucinated the whole thing. But my sickness was completely gone. The people walked past me, and I smiled before I got up to to walk in. I looked up. Oh. So he says, The people walked past me. I smiled, and before I got up to walk in, I looked up. There was a huge hawk circling in the sky above and a break in the fog. I was going to go with Graham Hawk Seeker Dunlop, too. (laughs) Were you? Yeah. Today? Yeah. Why? I don't know. I've had it on my phone for a while. Hawk seeker? Why? I don't know. You seem to be all about hawks. You just love hawks. Not really. No? It just happened that one day. And people like this, you know, reading about hawks. Seem like a hawk Reading guy. about hawks. So anyway, thanks for letting me ramble on. Love the show. Love you guys. And I will be supporting soon. Thanks for the hard work, guys. Your universal brother, MK Ultra. MK wow, that's, I, I forgot how awesome that email was. It's been a while. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, that's good. And uh, yeah, I hope everything's going well one day at a time. No kidding. Got a synchro now? Like, well, I, I could. Yeah, I do. I actually have a crazy synchronicity. A crazy know. synchronicity? Yeah. Ooh, that, ooh, shit. Which one am I going to pick? I want a good skull from a synchronicity If Graham reads it out, then Darren might give it to me Hey, don't you please read it low What you got? Uh, This one's going back to an episode Actually, I should probably link to this episode in here I'm just going to make a note in the show notes here What episode? Uh, I won't tell you yet so Wait. this is from Nicholas. You won't tell me. From Orlando. He says, Hi, Graham and Darren. I've been listener for about two years now and always enjoy the beginning banter between you guys. And this is my first time reaching out. 
So I travel for work quite a lot and have had the opportunity to visit a lot of places. My most recent gig, I was on my way to Atlanta, Georgia from Orlando and decided to listen to your guys' latest show with David Charles Plate. As I was driving, David was discussing the synchronicities between the release of the movie The Visitor and the two big hotel fires in 1946. One fire at the MGM Grand in Paradise, Nevada, which is the county that the Las Vegas Strip is located, and the Weinkauf Hotel. At the time, I didn't think anything of it, but when I got to the hotel that I was staying at for my show, I could tell it was a very old building and had been remodeled. It's called the Ellis Hotel on Peachtree. After I checked in, I decided to go and find some pinball machines to pass the time because my show was until the morning. When I got back, there was a group of people outside the hotel and I started talking with them. One of the ladies said that she was sensitive to paranormal things and she she believed that this hotel was haunted or cursed. So I decided to look up the history and it turns out that the hotel we were staying at was the fucking Weinkauf. And it had been renamed. Needless to say, it was a really hard time for me to fall asleep that night, and I made sure I checked all the fire exits to make sure they, were, they weren't they were locked. Anyway, thank you guys for reading this, and I hope Darren gives me a good score. P.S. I'm a music producer by trade, and I was thinking about doing a jingle for you guys. Any suggestions of what you guys might, might want or need? I want a gram rap. A what? I want a gram rap. Like gram rap? I want someone to no. cut your voice off no, a bunch no, no, of episodes no. and make you a rap. No, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not fair to ask for. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just that giggle would do. That's like the chorus. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. We got so many jingles. We could always use more. Like, I don't like to, I think they're better when people just send them in. Well, we do, we do need And they don't ones. always just have to be jingles either. Like people are doing little song things now or people do little skits that I play at the end of the show. Did I play the coffee enema one? Yeah, I don't know. That's pretty disgusting, really, that one. It's a bit much. Yeah. And I'll, put, I'll play it, it at the end well of the show. It was well done, though. I mean, it was very well done. It is very Oh, well yeah, done. We, we, there's also a chat, a perpetual chat that we've got going on, chats that people like to fuck around in. Sometimes they send around n- fucking yeah. naked pictures of themselves. I would like to know what his favorite pinball game is, though. I would say Medieval Madness is the classic, the best game ever. I like Street Fighter 2. Pinball? Yeah. Really? Yeah. ACDC's pretty... They got, they got a lot of good ones. But I, my buddy's a, got a couple pinball games in his house. He's got like Is four he? or five. Yeah, it's awesome. Fuck, we, I'd like to have a pinball. We should get... We should get... Uh, pinball machine for the satellite office. <laughs> <laughs> as long as it's imaginary, we might as well have it filled with imaginary <laughs> things. <laughs> Just to make it clear, we don't have a satellite office. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for the synchronicity. Well, what are you going to score that one after that David David Charles Plate one? And you he know, stayed in the, the late, hotel. Stayed in the hotel that he listened to the episode on the way down. I mean, that's pretty good. He's got it to do with us, you know. He's offering to support the show by sending synchronicity. So you got to bump it up like that. Six point four two. Oh, that's pretty weak, really. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give it an eight point nine two. Actually, no, I'll give it a nine. No, you're gonna bump it right up to a nine. No, eight point nine two. Okay. Eight point yeah. nine two. Oh yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's a good one. All right. Well, I got a couple. Um, geez, this is kind of long too, but I do have a couple crazy trip reports. Trip reports? Yeah. Kind of bad trip reports. Like, you know, we talk about recovery in this and stuff, and, you know, we talk about some good trip reports. Like, you know, some drugs can be enlightening, some of the psychedelic kinds and stuff, but sometimes you can have some pretty, pretty bad. Oh, well, you take us down trip. and then I'll bring us back up. Okay. Psychedelics are catalysts of consciousness. I had a good trip on the weekend, if anyone's wondering. I did a lot of crying. But it was m- mostly from laughing so hard. <laughs> this is from uh, Don in Eaton Rapids, Mich- Michigan. He says, once when I was younger, a friend and I were hanging out in the cemetery near my house. We were parked and just kicking back and smoking a little weed. This is back on Northern Lights. First hit the scene in the early 90s. I don't even know what that is. 
So we, we decided to do some nitrous oxide, and we're using the big balloons, the ones you bounce on a string, hold tree crackers each. Somehow, I had the bright idea to see how much I could inhale before passing out. I then cracked three into each balloon. I hyperventilated the first one in and out, and then devoured the second and third the same way. The next thing I knew, I was standing or floating in what I now think might be dark matter. But at the time, I couldn't figure that part out. For some reason, I was compelled to reach out as if there was a door in front of me. And I gripped the door knob and turned, and it pulled. The crack of the door. I leaned forward, stuck my head inside to sneak a peek, and what I saw was completely indescribable. But that being said, it was like all sight, sound, smell, touch, taste, every sensation laid out in front of me. It was beautiful, but it scared the shit out of me. I slammed the door, took a step back, and the next thing I knew, I was staring. The next thing I knew, I was staring at it. the stars on my back. Ooh. So I was staring was at the on stars on my back with my friend freaking the hell out, saying that I was not breathing and that he thought I was dead. I could also remember and f- still feel everything that was shown to me until I tried to tell my friend about it. It was like completely wiped out of my brain. I can try to explain it that way. I did hear, but it doesn't do it justice. Sorry if this is such a long rambling report. You guys are great. <laughs> Don't try this at home, kids. It wasn't a very good idea. And I probably lost a lot of brain cells. Brain cells are overrated. Oh, come on. That's no, not, you definitely nonsense. need your brain cells. Yeah. Neurons. So there you go. Yeah, don't do that. Is that the last one you got? No, I, do have, I do have another one. Yeah, I might as well talk about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is from Billy. Billy. Billy M? Uh, Billy W. I don't know, Billy W. Bill W. That's actually Bill Wilson's, uh, that's his, uh, the guy who started A way back in the 30s. Bill W. That's his name. Oh. Yeah. If you don't know, uh, you know, I think I'm going to try and get Emery on the show. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. That's a great idea. Okay. So, trip report. So, I've been meaning to send you guys a trip report for a while now and just don't really know where to start. But first things first, I've been listening to you guys for about a year and a half. Well, that seems to be a, Time frame. We got That's some listeners fun. like a year and a half ago. Now right? I've heard every episode and I can also, I've also recommended a guest or two and you've had one on, which was Patrick Jordan. I found the show through the higher side chats. Okay. On with the trip report. Well, that's interesting. You found the show through the higher side chats too. How do you find us through the higher side chat? Because he mentions us a couple of times. Oh, does he? Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Greg. I know he listens. Didn't know he mentioned us. I have many I could choose from, but figure I'll give you the bad trip. Well, that's good timing for this episode. In case the worst trip I had. And, and anyway, I'd done a lot of mushrooms growing up because I live close to a shroom field that has now turned into a car dealership. That's usually the way it goes. Oh my God. That's just, <laughs> they pay paradise, put up a parking lot. <laughs> it wasn't until I moved to Baytown, Texas from Pasadena, Texas that I ever tried LSD. It was cra- it was crazy back in the nineties when I was in high school. Acid was everywhere in the city of Baytown. I have suspicions that the city of Baytown is some sort of test laboratory for different drugs because of the waves of them that come and go. That's interesting. He's probably onto something there. That that probably deserves a bit of research. I just about burnt my hair off. In Baytown, Texas. Anyways, me and a few buddies were at a party where everyone else was drinking, but we were waiting on a friend to show up with the acid. He did and gave me two hits of window pane and told me he would be back in a few to pick us up. I ate the two hits and didn't take long for the colors to start creeping in on the walls. He, he showed back on the wall, up the walls. He showed back up and asked where my two <laughs> hits were, and I told him I already ate them. He said, why? I was going to put them in your eyes so you could go... So he could trip harder. So he pulls two more out and talks me into letting them, let him, letting him put them in my eyes. It burned bad, and I just held them there in each eye for about maybe ten minutes until I couldn't take the burn in anymore, and then ate the rest of the paper that didn't dissolve in my eyes. Oof, that's scary. Needless to say, Jesus. I was tripping don't balls put by this point. Shit in your eyes, people. And don't even you don't even really have to do LSD. You can meditate instead if you want. To reach some sort of, anyways, I used to do it at the party. I was, I never had enough reverence for it back in the day. 
Nobody's fucking meditating into some LSD. I've heard Kundalini, maybe. Yeah. Isn't so, that like a combination of meditating and yoga? And masturbation? Kind of breath. No, not really. Breath work. I mean, you could reach it by breathing if you wanted to, if you're really into it. What? Masturbation? No, like Climax? orgasm through yeah. breathing, but it's pretty hard work. Have you tried it? <laughs> Have you tried? <laughs> uh, no, kind of. <laughs> no luck? Well, it's, it's hard, not from, I mean, you know. Okay, here's the experiment. We've talked about this here's, before. No, no, here's the experiment. No, I don't want to get here's into this right now. <laughs> wait, 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 save up some blue balls again. <laughs> like a month. That's what and you probably then have to try do. That's probably, <laughs> the exercise. <laughs> that's probably what you yeah. do. I think women have a... And a, you can have visual stimulation. We, yeah, yeah. Women have an easier time. <laughs> and then we mop it out. <laughs> <sighs> okay good we're just getting into the, this part okay in my city of baytown they had just built a new suspension bridge and retired the tunnel that people used to drive through to get into the city we rode to the bridge taking turns laying back of the pickup truck watching the big yellow cables go by riding over the bridge it felt like the cables were pulling you up after a while i started to get really paranoid because i had a pocket full of weed that i stole from my dad but I kept thinking that every car behind us was a cop chasing us, and I threw the dope. And I'm, I'm sure I was looking like and talking pretty crazy. There was five of us, two in the cabin of the truck and two more in the back. My buddies, my two buddies in the back could tell I was having a bad trip and were huddled together talking about maybe they should get me home. Me being paranoid and tripping balls thought they were conspiring against me. I cut my hand. I've so been there. <laughs> I cut my hands to look into the back window of the truck and see the driver who I just met that night past the passenger who I had known for maybe about a week, a pistol. I freaked out because my other buddy, I asked my other buddy what the gun was for and he said, we we're going to go shoot it. I said, where are we going? He said to the middle of nowhere. I freaked out thinking... They were going to kill me because, well, to be honest, we were some crazy ass kids back then. And I just moved to the city and met these guys maybe four months before all this. I jumped out of the back of the truck while we were doing anywhere from between 60 to 75 miles an hour. I hit my feet, then slid for a while on my face and shot back up on my feet, running straight for a semi truck. I realized what I was heading for and turned into the field next to the feeder, the feeder road. Then I heard my name being yelled from the truck. I remember showing back up at the party and a girl gives me a huge glass of milk, saying, drink it. As soon as the milk hit my lips, I started to see the actuality of what just went down. By the time I finished the glass, I was sober and felt the pain. I have still have scars on my face and body to this day, and my jaw still pops out of place now and then from that event. Needless to say, I never put acid in my eyes again nor will I recommend it. I did, however, learn a lot about the mind and how acid work. Hope this wasn't too long, but I just wanted to tell you how it all went down. Love the show and keep up the good work. Much love, Billy. Thanks, Billy. Another one, just don't do this at home. I mean, no. really, just you don't even have to, to do it. No. No. Don't put acid in your eyes. Go listen to this episode with Dave Smith, and he can talk about mindfulness and... I'm an experienced psychonaut. <laughs> so when it sounds like I'm having a blast, it's because I am. <laughs> but that's because I know what I'm doing. <laughs> tread with caution. Yep, tread with caution. Acid's a different animal, too, yep. than mushrooms. Yeah. It's a little more, I don't know, artificial, chemically kind of... But that's a set and setting thing, right? I would never trip with someone I just met four months ago. Four, four months ago? He was with people that he just met that night. That's even worse. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a set. But I mean, that's what I would have done when I was younger. I mean, that's what we, you know, that's Mind the you, thing. I just did I that to, just... my, to M and J. Yeah. Well, no, they, but they, that's different. That's different. Because we know them so, so well. It's different. Yeah. Common. It's kind of Common denominator. Yeah. yeah. We're the lowest common denominator. Yeah. From the pictures that are flying around the chats, you would think that we are the lowest common denominator. Yeah. Just didn't take that. Didn't take Grim Steak and Kilgar long turn that into some sort of weird homoerotic cesspool. 
Not that there's anything wrong with that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Join the chats. But what was I going to say about that? You're going to say join the chats. Mm. Stop on by, stop on by. Stop on by, stop on by. Stop on by, stop on by. Hello, Mr. Gardner, the chats. The jingle Felix wrote while he was kicked out of the chats. <laughs> So I do have the UFO quote, or we've got to keep up going with that, the profound. Down and Graham, going deep. It's a profound UFO quote of the week. Words to ponder. I like that jingle. We got a this feed, we, we really got like feedback the other day. He's like, I just listened to my first UFO episode. He's like, lose the, the intro, week. lose the jingles. Thanks. That's good feedback. Yeah. Fast forward. Did you tell him that? Just I, just did, FFW? I just blocked him. Did you? Yeah. Wow. Actually, on YouTube, I don't block him. I mute him. Oh, that was YouTube. Well, you can't even listen to those trolls. Okay. This is it. An object, like an oblong pearl, drew steadily closer until perhaps a mile away when, right under my gaze, as it were, it suddenly vanished. But it reappeared close to where it had vanished, and it drew closer. I could see the dull gleam of light on nose and back. It came on, but instead of increasing in size, it diminished as it approached. When quite near, it suddenly became its own ghost. For one second, I could see, see clear through it, and the next, it had vanished. That's Sir Francis Chichester, June 10th, 1931, flying in the gypsy moth over the Tasman Sea. Tasmanian Sea? Right on. So yeah, there's a time, like I said. Oh, jeez. Bingo, bingo. Social media jingle. Don't forget to rate, comment, and go subscribe to the Grime America Newsletter. Bingo, bingo, social media jingle. Don't forget to rate, comment, and go subscribe to the Grime America News. Okay, you got some social we've got, media stuff? We've got on uh, David Charles... Wait, isn't this the same guy who created the whole Pepe meme while pretending to be independent? I said no, and he said, okay, not the same guy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, do you not pre-read any of these things before you do this segment? No. Just, like, just... From Coop W, great show today, guys. Thanks for sharing the info and the time it takes to put it all together. Bless up and stay frosty. From Ben Bishop, Grant Cameron is like a neutron bomb of information. <laughs> ah, we got from that is an Baron Von Taco Cat. Ah, shit, you said my motherfucking name on the podcast. I'm famous and shit now. To which STVBRSN replied, As far as I'm concerned, you've been famous since the first time I saw one of your comments years ago. You have pretty much my favorite username yet. That was probably Brian Sovereign himself re responding. Was that to the Brian Sovereign Tech, the Sovereign Tech episode? Is that, is that Brian Sovereign? I don't know. S V R S T V B R S N. They've been following us for years. Oh, no, that's not him. Best thing about Grant's pace is you, you totally <laughs> slow down with the nachos and red wine refill. Have to do more legacy Grant audio. He's so laid back and nice and slow. Really gives you all the time in the world to try and soak it all up in one sitting. Perfect meeting of similar minds. Bunch of stoners versus hyperventilating dude in red zone for three hours. <laughs> Hockey reflex has actually made it possible to hop into a barely noticeable pause on the side of Grant more than once. Don't try to listen to this at like half speed. That's cheating. Wow, Grant, there was a lot of feedback about Grant. Grant Cameron Unleashed is a great idea, really dropping some knowledge in this interview, and I'm only 140 minutes into the thing. <laughs> 
First rate episode, guys. Classic stuff. So interesting. I tend to agree with most of what Grant's saying here. Are UFO is a phenomenon? At least it makes sense to me the way he puts it. And then uh, we have MMA Lafie. It's better at 1.5 speed once you get used to his speech patterns. You're welcome. It's like I, u- I usually listen to these interview podcasts at 1.25 speed. I think every time I hear Grant speak, he's going a little faster than the time before. <laughs> Soon we'll have to slow him down to understand him. I'll put a link to that episode in the show notes as well, since you got so much uh, feedback on that. On the that Randall Carlson slideshow. Yeah. Randall Carlson equals amazing. Everyone else equals unbearable. <laughs> Good thing we had him on five times. Yeah. Oh, we got uh, here. We've got uh, who's this? Voids. Voidus Ying Yang. This is the best Stuart Ham- Hammerhoff interview I've ever heard. Wow. I've corresponded with him as I research music consciousness energy healing. From quantum logic and math is North- non-Western music theory. Hammerhoff agrees that consciousness is more like music, but non-Western music or an anharmonic. I also corresponded with the Indian nanotech researcher he me- mentions, testing the ultrasound amplitude resonance of the microtubules. Oof. Also, Penrose says the real secret to is time is asymmetric. And this stuff goes back to the Big Bang. Amazing stuff. It also explains the ecological crisis today as well. I have more details on my blog. Thanks. Wow. I wonder how that explains the ecological one. You asked about Wim Hof. I connect the science of his TUMO training with Stuart Hammerhoff research in my free PDF. Just Ooh. Google Idiot's Guide to, to Taoist Alchemy, Needin, King Gong, Yoga, Ning Gong, Training, PDF come archive. On, Thanks. Come on, are you serious? It, well, I can't, I don't know what those words, I don't know how to. Idiot's what? Guide to Taoist, Taoist Yoga? Idiot's Guide to Taoist, Alchemy, Needin, King Gong, Yoga, Ning Qigong, Gong, Training, Qigong. Qigong, Yoga, Ning Gong, Training, PDF archive. Could have just gave us a URL. So collagen is piezoelectric and resonates at ultrasound, which activates the vagus nerve and stores up energy as negative entropy. There is also an infrasound feedback, the theta brainwaves. So as Hammerhaus says, outwardly, it seems their brain and metabolism slows down while internally the frequency goes higher. Subharmonics of frequency of stronger amplitude. Wow. That's a pretty crazy comment. We should get that guy on the show. We I mean, should. Hey, come on the show. I'll see if I, I'll, I'll comment that. <laughs> I don't think he listens to all the episodes. No, he's probably... Video oh, but, presentations but a link took to that, you guys though. long enough to get here. <laughs> Hashtag respect. The sound on the channel <laughs> seems to be dead. It only comes... Yeah, I know the fucking YouTube only comes through one, one ear. I don't know how to fix it. I've given up. Uh, from Big thank you to Darren and Graham having me over to the Igloo for another visit to the land of Grimerica. This time to record a first ever live video show complete with star charts and ancient artwork. Really enjoyed our conversation and hope everyone else will too. Here's a new blog post talking about the show, which includes links to related content for those interested in exploring further. Thanks, David. Yeah, that's all I got. Right on. Thanks, Darren. That was good. Not bad, eh? That's a good little set. That's a fun little segment. So I'm going to put links to Hammerov's and Grant Cameron's episodes in the show notes and that link to that uh, Idiot's Guide to uh, Alchemy, Qigong, Nigong Meditation or whatever. Qigong. You're just totally insulting somebody. You can't I know. It. I'm going to send you a screenshot of it so okay. you can put the URL. Oh, I'll find it. I, you can't put it. URLs that are like 30 words like that. I can. F- what do you mean? I'm going to search it, do the link, and I'll put it in the show notes. It's not a link. Yes, I'll find it. Graham will find it. Yeah. He will find it. Or he just will give up. (laughs) (laughs) Both are possible. Is that it? Yeah, that's it, man. This is a great episode with Dave Smith and talking about, uh, yeah, the start of refuge recovery, the Buddhist-inspired path to recovery, and... And also his uh, Dharma Saint, his uh, Rebel Dharma Saint. He done, does a lot of teaching and workshops and coaching. And that's great. Great episode. Yeah, it's a gooder. Enjoy, yeah. guys. Get the app. Do everything in the show notes. Most of all, enjoy the chat with Dave Smith.
All right, tonight we've got Dave Smith with us. He's a Buddhist meditation teacher, and he's empowered to teach through the Against the Stream Buddhist Meditation Society, and he's an addiction treatment specialist. He helped uh, start Refuge Recovery like seven seven years ago. Um, I can't believe it's been going that long, and that's the one that I, I participate here in Calgary. So it's good to have you on the show to talk about all this stuff. Dave, welcome. Hey, thanks a lot. It's good to, good to hear your voice again. Yeah, it was a great, uh, great little workshop I attended with you. I really, really appreciate, um, you know, your help and helping people in recovery and that type of thing. You know, and usually we, we don't always go back into people's backgrounds on this show, but I think for for this one, especially we're talking about this kind of stuff, it's probably good to talk a little bit about how, you know, your background and how you found, you know, your, your path into, into Buddhism and recovery, that type of thing. Yeah, sure. No, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. It's, it's a long story and it's a story that continues to carry on even to this day. So it's kind of a yeah. evolving process. So, you know, I, um, grew up in new England, you know, I grew up in the Boston area and, um, was one of those kids who just never felt comfortable ever. And, um, you know, I was around a lot of alcohol growing mm-hmm. up. I thought alcohol and drugs were just something that everybody did. And um, I couldn't wait to grow up and drink alcohol like my dad and all his friends. It was something that was always on my radar. And um, I had a lot of trauma in my early life and in the arena of like, uh, like loss. So I had a lot of, I had a sister, an older sister who died in a car accident pretty tragically when I was 11 um, back in 1989. And then about, so, so that really just kind of by the age of, at the age of 11, I was, um, you know, probably had what they would now identify as post-traumatic stress symptoms yeah. and didn't have any resources. And, you know, it was in the eighties, the school guidance council wasn't exactly very helpful. And I just turned to drinking, you know, I was drinking pretty much fairly regularly by the time I was 12 and started doing drugs soon after that. And, you know, probably an unpopular thing to say often though is, you know, I, don't think I would have survived my teen years if it wasn't for drugs and alcohol. I mean, it was my only coping mechanism. It was my only strategy to really get through uh, teenage years. And teenage years, you know, from what I remember, are usually uh, not so great for most people. But they certainly weren't for me. And then when I was 18, I had just graduated high school. And uh, my girlfriend, who I just fell in love with, first apartment out of high school, uh, we got run down by a drunk driver and she got killed and I was there left to discover the body. Um, and another just very traumatic event, a really traumatic episode that resulted in loss and death. And, um, so I, at that point I was pretty, my trauma was pretty, pretty substantial. And also I had this deeply, uh, strong feeling that like the universe or, God or whatever was against me. I felt like the world or the universe or whatever was sort of out to get me. So I I was a little bit paranoid and I was also just a little bit, um, not a little bit, I was a lot of bit disappointed by life. And um, it was actually at that time that I started practicing Buddhist meditation. So my story is pretty nonlinear in that way. Mm -hmm. I um, was, you know, I was, I drank and used and was doing better Buddhist meditation retreats throughout my whole twenties. But the big thing for me and the thing that I really still am blown away by is when I did learn basic mindfulness practice. So I was introduced from a Dharma teacher at the insight meditation society in, in Barry, Massachusetts, basically breath awareness, this practice that we probably take for granted. The idea, the basic idea that I could take my attention out of my mind and I could put it in my body or my breath. And that if I paid attention to my breathing, my blessed breathing for, I don't know, 10 or 15 seconds, I just kind of felt better. And I, my body would relax. And all of the stories and the, uh, the anger and the betrayal and the loss and all of that self-centeredness, really, that self-centered thinking was just all thoughts in my mind. <laughs> and that I could actually get out of that was a very profound and radical shift for me at the age of 18. Yeah, no doubt. Huh. That's similar. And in a way I had, uh, you know, even during, like I didn't get sober clean and sober till I was 38, 
And I was, when I, in my early twenties, I took some meditation courses as well. I think that's one of the things that helped me is having that kind of spiritual interest or background when I was younger. So what, when, you know, when you talked about the uh, needing alcohol and drugs in, in, as a teenager, I was thinking about society and how much shame I had around, around using, like I really had to hide it from everybody. I kept it to myself. Like, do you think that if society was a little different that you as a teenager and others as a teenager could cope with, you know, experimenting with that a little bit more without having the shame around it? Well, you know, I actually, you know, everybody's different, right? We all have different experiences. I didn't have very much shame about it. I was pretty proud of it. You know, I mean, I hung out with the druggies in school and we partied and raged. Yeah. Also, my father drank a lot. So I didn't get, I had no stigma that it was really bad or wrong. I just thought I was partying. And, you know, then I got into bands and I, I spent about 10 years playing in bands and touring in bands. And mm-hmm. maybe we'll get to that a little bit. But I, you know, I watched you know, MTV and, you know, within to Guns N' Roses and Metallica. I mean, I wanted to be a drug addict. I mean, I look, I look forward to it. Right. Yeah. Which that's, is that's a good an point. uncommon point of view. Yeah. That's you know, a good for point. For me, it was like, yeah, I was like, I totally want to do that. Yeah. For me, it was okay. The drinking and the, and the, the, the soft drugs and stuff like that. But when it, when it got hard for me, that was when, uh, it, there was a lot of shame around it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that so, happened to me as well, but yeah. that was more fast forward 10 years, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's where it ended up, you know, for sure. So is that what you, is that when you realized that you had to leave, like renunciate from, from this? Well, you know, I kind of, you know, I, so from 18 to 28, I used, I drank, I did drugs, I sold drugs, I played in bands and I had this kind of rock and roll lifestyle that was, that worked for me for many years. But I did sit these Buddhist meditation retreats every summer, and I did know that there was a better way to live. And I did feel a little bit like the way I was living and the way I was drinking and using. I, I did feel like it was out of line with my values, but it was just too much fun to give it up. Mm-hmm. So you know, when it got to the end for me, probably the last three years um, of my drinking and using, I was it was in a very, very difficult sort of paradox of like, I had kind of gotten everything I wanted. You know, I was, you know, in my late, mid, late twenties, I was touring in bands. I was putting out records. You know, I was playing lots of big festivals in Europe. I mean, I had like kind of succeeded. And so my music career was kind of successful, but my inner life, you know, shame, guilt, self-hatred, my inner life was just so vacant that I didn't know what to do. And, you know, so I just, I was so addicted. I just tried to drink those feelings away. And I tried to, I tried to use at my shame or self-hatred and it just didn't work. It just stopped working. And, um, interestingly enough for me, the quitting my band was actually quitting harder than quitting drinking because I I had my, my self-centeredness. I was so caught up with being this person in this band who did this thing. That actually, and I quit drinking the day I quit my van. So it happened at the same time. Wow. But yeah, for me, it's, it just brought me to that place of like, you know, A, I felt a lot of shame and self-hatred. And B, I wasn't happy and the shit wasn't working anymore anyway. Yeah. So then how long, how long from then did you get into to like teaching this stuff or actually taking that part of it very seriously? Well, you know, I actually have to say that truth be told, part of my unfolding was, you know, so basically here's kind of a crazy story for you. So I get clean and sober. I'm 28 years old. And so what do you do when you get clean and sober? You go to AA, right? Like I knew about AA. I knew I was probably going to end up there someday anyway, because I used to go in my <laughs> teenage years. And I just wasn't having it, man. I was just, I was too, I was too arrogant. I was too full of shit. And I just didn't want, I wasn't going to get a sponsor. I wasn't going to do service work. I certainly wasn't going to do the steps and I was not going to do God. So when I had about 60 days sober, I decided I was going to go to Insight Meditation Society and sit the three month course. So every year they do a, a meditation retreat that's silent, no talking, no eye contact. 14 hours, 12 to 14 hours of meditation a day for three months Holy straight. Shit. So I, 
I did that with 60 Days Sober. And I went in there with this arrogant attitude that I was just going to like bang this thing out. I was like, I'll sit for three months. I'm just going to get this alcoholism thing, this whole addiction thing. I'm just going to like fucking meditate it right out of my system. <laughs> and, um, and I totally didn't. That's not what happened. And uh, so I, um, I left that retreat totally confused. I mean, there was also, there was a lot of good things that happened on that street. I don't want to speak about it too poorly. It was, you know, uh, it did work. You know, I'm still clean and sober 15 years later. So, but it, I, I got the sense that what happened was I really, at that point, knew I just had to do the 12 steps. I just knew it. I, I, I had this kind of attitude that Buddhism, especially at this point in America, was like for like well-adjusted, affluent white people, you know, who like didn't have real problems. And I actually had real problems and I needed to. So I went back to AA and just totally surrendered. I just went in there. I got a sponsor. I worked the steps. You know, I, I, you know, I learned in Buddhist practice, there's this term we have called sila, which is one of the three trainings that we train in ethics. We train in meditation and we train in wisdom. Mm-hmm. And AA is really what taught me ethics. I learned how to stop stealing. I learned how to stop lying. I learned honesty in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I learned about personal accountability. I learned about inventory. I learned about being of service to others. I learned compassion in AA. You know, so I spent five years after that retreat not doing a whole lot of meditation and really just going to like, you know, five meetings a week, step work, sponsors, you know, book studies, commitments. Like I was just totally... And my, my crew, my, you know, I was, it was Boston. So it was like Massachusetts, AA, big book thumper, <laughs> you know, like hard, hardcore man. And that, that's what I needed. I needed, I need somebody to, I need somebody to look at me in the eyes and say, you need to sit down and shut your mouth, young man, cause you got nothing to say. And, you know, that's one approach and it worked for me. And it's frankly what I needed at the time. Yeah, man, those hardcore men's groups can be pretty. Uh, pretty intense and, you know, hold you pretty accountable to to what you're saying you're going to do and all that kind of stuff. I think that's that's pretty healthy. Good foundation there. Yeah, yeah, it was. It gave me a really great foundation. So, um, you know, that was kind of, you know, the first five years of my, of my sobriety was really, I mean, I started a construction business and I, you know, I was a worker amongst workers, you know, and I helped my family out and, you know, I met a girl in AA and I got married and, I did all the sort of stuff that you do in your first five years and uh, I'm totally grateful for that. So what about that uh, three month silent uh, retreat? I mean, I can I know people that can't even get through the 10 day Vipassana. I mean, how was that? That must've been very, very hard. And did you have any, you know, moments of clarity in there besides, you know, coming out of there and realizing that you, you could probably use AA. Was there any, you know, ego death or anything crazy like that? Well, you know, it was it was long, I, and I probably had some traumatic symptoms going on. I might have been dissociating some of the time. I mean, I had everything from deep, deep concentration to really, really blissed out states of mind. I mean, I had all the beautiful things that you hear about in meditation, mm-hmm. and I had lots of suffering, and I had lots of doubt, and I had lots of blame, and I had lots of... Um, I think what I learned on that retreat, truth be told, I don't think I knew it at the time. Right. And I don't think I knew it for maybe a long time, maybe not even up to this moment because no one's ever really asked me, is I actually learned humility. Mm-hmm. You know, I learned humility in the sense of I realized there was something about my mind body that was just really, really powerful. And, you know, I learned, you know, craving in the mind and the mind's tendency to want things to be different. You know, my whole life, man, up until this moment, what, 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 what do I suffer with? I suffer when I want my life to be different. I want this moment to be different. I want this day to be different. I want my girlfriend to act different. I just, when I want other, I suffer. Exactly. And I've got a big dosage of that. And, you know, when you're, when you're staring down the barrel of the mind and the heart, you know, all day long, you know, I just really learned that um, I knew that I needed to do, I needed to do something that was actionable. You know, I was like, I'm not going to meditate my way out of this situation. I'm actually going to have to act my way out of this situation. And so that's what really 
gave me the humility to go, you know what? I need to start taking responsibility for myself. Wow. Yeah. I totally resonate with the, you know, the not wanting to be in this moment. I mean, I find that mindfulness for me was the key to some sort of contentment or happiness that I always wanted before. And, and it really comes down to just being okay with most of the moments. Like, of course I still would sometimes want to be somewhere else or obsess about being in another state or whatever, but for the most part, you know, when I'm driving, I'm okay with where I'm going and I don't, you know, need to be somewhere else. And when I'm home, I don't need to be somewhere else. Like, it seems like that's brought the mindfulness itself. Cause that was to me, the practice of being in the moment in that moment and kind of accepting where you are. That was the key to me. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that's what mindfulness does is it allows us to live in the present time or, you know, one day at a time, one breath at a time, one moment at a time, you know, it's all the same kind of thing. And it's just trying to, I think in a very pragmatic way, I think the Buddha was a radical pragmatist. It's just trying to learn how to live the life you're having rather than being preoccupied with the life you could be having or should be having if things had gone differently. Yeah, exactly. Huh. So can you... And you know, that's that's tough. <laughs> that's what? That's tough, you know? Oh, yeah. That, that's tough. Yeah. No, but it's a, it's one of the most powerful tools. I mean, it is an actionable thing. You know, the more you try it, the more you learn about it, the more you really do feel a difference, like a physical difference of just being able to step away from those obsessive thoughts and separate yourself a little bit. And that's just only a thought. It's like I heard you, I heard one of your recent podcasts. Oh yeah. I forgot to mention that you do that podcast as well. The rebel rebel saint, right? We'll put that in the show notes for people. Um, I was listening to your four, uh, four foundations of mindfulness. And you're really talking about how your thought is like your, your sixth sense in a way, or your feel, you know, you've got all your other senses and your thought is just another one of those. And you talk about the only the 18 things that can happen to you you know, that you can be feeling right. or sensing. There's really only 18 things. I mean, can you talk a little bit about, can you dig into a little bit about how mindfulness can help with craving and it recovery and just how important of a tool that is itself and how you can, it, you know, grow that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, that's kind of my whole world, right? So it's a great <laughs> question and a hard question to answer. But I think that one of the, so if we really want to just be real basic about it, it's just that like, okay, we're talking about suffering, we're talking about the mind. And so most people, doesn't matter who they are, if you ask them, they can identify that they suffer in ways that seem to be quite unnecessary, right? So that's the sort of baseline for the mind. The mind creates suffering, and, and much of it seems quite unnecessary. So the million-dollar question is, if, if what I said is just true, are there things you can do is there something you can do about that? Now, you're not powerless over that. There is a way in which you can intervene on the suffering process. And, you know, the Buddha figured this out 2,600 years ago, and he developed a whole system of living that addresses this very idea. So what you need to be able to do is if, if that's true, and if you can follow me down, you know, if you can follow my trail of breadcrumbs right now, then you have to learn how to watch your mind. You have to be able to sit, and this is what the neuroscientists call metacognition, hmm. thinking about thinking, mindfulness, is that you can actually, if you know, in, in a science perspective, it's kind of the most evolved part of the human brain. It's this frontal, prefrontal lobe, prefrontal cortex. It's not hardware, it's software. Hmm. And so when we're mindful and we bring our attention to sensory experience like the body and the breath and feelings and emotions, and we get our attention out of thinking too much about everything all the time, we kind of get this sensibility. We kind of get this like access to this mindfulness or Wi-Fi signal. And once we're able to establish that, then we can use that as a way to recognize the ways in which we suffer that seem to be unnecessary. Are we driven by anxiety, which is a term we throw around? Well, what is anxiety? Anxiety is being preoccupied with the future, worrying, predicting, fixing, inventing problems that haven't happened, and then trying to come up with a strategy to fix them. You know, and so you can watch your mind do that, and you can also get out of that neighborhood. 
And just with the past, we find that, you know, anxiety typically is about the future. Depression is typically about the past. And stress is typically about right now. So if I'm always scared and anxious about the future and feeling guilty and regretful about the past, I'm going to feel really stressed out right now. And I need tools and skills and resources on how to manage that other than smoking crack and drinking alcohol (laughs) or eating cookies or looking at, I mean, the world is a buffet for addiction behaviors that medicate stress. Well, maybe there's a meditative contemplative practice called mindfulness that you can use to manage, to reduce, and to ultimately eradicate that stress. Now that, Right there, what I just said, I think is a very attractive idea for most people. Definitely. You know, so then so then it's like, well, then now what? Right now you got to start practicing mindfulness and you have to come to terms with the timing and the situation and the, and the stress of that and the fact that the mind is, um, you know, it, 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 the mind can be a tool and the mind can be a weapon. And it's like a knife, you know, it can, and so are we becoming skilled in using our mind as a tool for genuine happiness and liberation and, you know, contentment, or are we using it as a weapon for creating blaming or having contempt for the world or uh, giving ourselves a hard time? You know, you can look at it in, in that way, just like, just like a knife or a hammer or whatever. So the mind is very similar in that way that it can be used as a tool or it can be used as a weapon. Yeah. So yeah, noticing that a craving is really just a craving and there's something and there's some power in acknowledging something without attaching yourself to it that would dissipate it. Yeah, that's right. And that's what makes it so hard because the craving, the craving and aversion, wanting, not wanting, or fight or flight are protected. That's that's not software, that's hardware. You know, that's, that's, that's that midbrain amygdala, you know, the craving in the mind-body system and the nervous system. Uh, you know, like an alcoholic walks into to a bar or a restaurant and sees a tray of beers, walk by with the waitress, you know, there's, there's going to be craving is going to arise. Uh, you, I don't think you can, I don't think that you can chop that out. Um, I don't think that you can chop out these cravings and aversions. You can learn how to manage them. You can learn how to not act on them, but you, they still, because of our biological instinct to have pleasure and avoid pain, you know, we're, we're, we have evolved as creatures with these uh, instincts. We just have to learn how to manage them. And so we have to be careful. We don't think mindfulness is going to, you know, we're not going to have some sort of emotional lobotomy where craving just goes away, but we can definitely learn how to manage it much better. Right. And and it will dissipate over time, right? Don't you find? I mean, specific, I specific ones, not craving in general, because it's always there in the background for different types of things. But, you know, as you heal from one type of, you know, addiction to another, I, I found anyways that it, it does, the specific cravings do dissipate over time. They do, I think. And I think that there's a, a, a kind of a barometer that I use is that I think they you know, they, they have, so there's the frequency of how often do I feel craving? I think the frequency decreases. Yeah. And then there's the height of the craving. How is it, you know, is it craving number eight, number nine? I think the height of it decreases over time. And then how long I'm in that craving episode, the duration of the craving also decreases slowly over time. So I think there's a way you, you can look at it more in a system of like, you know, these triggering events, they, they happen less frequently, they're not as strong and they don't last as long. And so that, that, that's kind of the nature of tolerance. So we could say that mindfulness is a way to, to create tolerance for craving or tolerance for discomfort or tolerance for anything that's unwanted. Uh, and so the more tolerance you have, the more able you are to manage with these experiences as they arise. And so, yeah, I think that you're right. They do dissipate over time, but you actually have to, put effort into that. It it, it doesn't happen by itself. You have to do something. Can you overdo it with tolerance and stuff like that? You get to the point where you're just sort of too passive and you let life sort of steamroll you? I think that does happen for a lot of people. Yeah, that's right. I think that people can 
um, you know, become conflict avoidant, you know, or they can become too, this happens to a lot of Buddhists, right? They think they have to be lovely, dovey, compassionate and kind all the time. And they become a doormat for the world. And people take advantage of them and they're easily manipulated and they, uh, they, they, they avoid conflict. Um, and so that's not what we're trying to do. But yeah, I think that we can, you know, we can be out of balance with just about anything. You know, I think that's one thing that's so good about Buddhist teachings is it's always about a middle way. Yeah, so how, do we have, how do we be in the middle? Yeah, the equanimity, equanimity yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. fascinating. So we can become too tolerant, yeah. Yeah, I love how uh, you were very you were very non dogmatic about your approach to recovery as well. I mean, you you know you talk about how this program or that program could work for everybody. It's all and it depends on what works for you. And you're pretty open to a lot of different uh, you know systems of recovery or processes of recovery. And I did want to ask you about you know lately we're hearing more and more scientific uh, trials and evidence about you know, um, MDMA and mushrooms or psilocybin and, and, uh, DMT and maybe even LSD as far as a tool for psychotherapy or addiction treatment. I mean, and then there's a whole bunch, there's a whole bunch of other ones as well. Um, Ibogaine and all that. What do you feel? What do you think about those types of, uh, solutions to this? What's that other one? Kratom? Kratom? Well, Kratom, yeah. Kratom is more of a yeah. painkiller, I think, but, uh, yeah. But it has helped people you as know, well. I- that's right. And if you asked me this question five years ago, it would have been a different answer. Right, I've gotten yeah. to be a lot more liberal. You know, one of the things that really helped me is that working as a substance abuse professional and working in treatment centers and just looking at the basic map of it. You know, when it comes to helping people recover from addiction, we ain't crushing it. We ain't even <laughs> kind of crushing it. You know, the, the, and we have the best advancements. We have all this new, all these new curriculums, all this new science, all this new research, and the numbers are just as bad as they were sixty fucking years ago. Are they really? You know, it's, it, it, oh yeah, they haven't gotten any better. In fact, one could argue that the boulder is going down the mountain, not up the mountain. <laughs> you know, so you know, so so that being the case, um, if somebody's like dying and strung out on heroin. You know, maybe they should go down to Mexico and take some ibogaine. Like, what's the what's the loss? So I feel a lot more liberal about different approaches. Um, you know, and I'm also suspicious about some of them as well. So I just think that when we look at, you know, if I was working with an individual, for example, you know, if we were going to triage the situation, you know, I would look at them and say, well, you know, maybe ayahuasca and ibogaine wouldn't be my first recommendation for like trying to get clean or sober. But, you know, you meet these people who have been in and out of AA for 15 years and they've been to treatment 27 times and they're the chronic relapsers. Maybe that guy, fuck it, send them to South Africa, let them take some ibogaine and some ayahuasca. I don't know. What's to lose? Yeah. Yeah, I I agree with you. I think there could be be solutions for different people. I mean, and I've also seen uh, people in recovery that have, you know, came out of ad- addiction through, um, through, uh, um, a- acid, even LSD or uh, ecstasy as well. I mean, people can also get, uh, even though those can be helpful, it's not like you're out of the, out of the clear with those types of drugs as well. I mean, and then, you know, I hear about guys like, let's say Graham Hancock, right. Who had that, uh, ayahuasca experience. It healed his pot addiction. He had a chronic pot addiction, but then he's been, wow. been to uh, Iowa. He's done the ayahuasca ceremony like I don't know, fifty or seventy or eighty times or something. So I, I think there's a risk that that just becomes the new addiction as well. I mean, you're just like they say, you're switching deck tiers on the Titanic. So I think back on that. the weed. Yeah, that's it. That's Rogan right, yeah. got him back on the weed. <laughs> well, yeah, and then yeah. So who knows? Uh, I think that's still a risk. It is. It's always a risk. I mean, that's the problem. And. You know, if you look at, like, I mean, some of the studies that I've read around Ibogaine, you know, it, it does work for a lot of people. But if you track the people long term, that a lot of people, if they don't if they don't maintain after about a year or 18 months, they usually relapse. So I think that what happens is you, if you know, and, and I think AA does a really brilliant job of making an argument for this thing called, you know, my sobriety is contingent upon the development of my, the maintenance of my spiritual condition. Right, you know, right. I think that that's a, a, a page out of the big book that I'll always take. Right. You know, you have to maintain, you know, it's the, addiction isn't a switch that gets switched off and you're just all better now. 
I mean, I think that that's a pretty safe argument to make. But it, it, it's more of like a volume knob that we can get our hands on. But we, we have to be doing something lifestyle-wise and therapeutically or spiritually or whatever word you like. We have to be doing, engaging in some kind of process that is continuing to readjust that that strong addictive tendency, or I think that people typically just don't make it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, that's what I mean. I've always said as well in the in the step eleven, which is that you know that sort of meditative aspect, you know, the prayer and meditation thing would be one of the most underrated aspects of it, and that's kind of where you know I like this refuge recovery that's come out. I mean, when I was in in uh, rehab, I read. Uh, Noah Levine's book, actually, Dharma Punks and Against the Stream, which is now, you know, the society that you 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 do or you used to teach through. And um, so, yeah, so that brings me to that kind of refuge recovery, which is really a Buddhist orientated path in recovery. Do you want to mention a little bit about that as, a, as one of these programs and tools and maybe how you got into that? Yeah, I mean, that was kind of a, a long road process, but I guess it started with this, is that you know, it started actually with people like Kevin Griffin, who started uh, Buddhism in the 12 Steps. He wrote a book called Buddhism oh, yeah, in the 12 Steps right. about yeah, 15, yeah. 15 years ago. Yeah, so what happened that, yeah. was people people were starting to use, people in AA were starting to use Buddhism kind of through the 11th step. And so there have been a couple, there have actually been several books written about Buddhism in the 12 Steps. And so it, what, what emerged in treatment and in 12 Steps and kind of in this subculture with like these sort of 12 step Buddhist people. And so, um, so there's a way you can in- incorporate Buddhism in the 12 steps and Noah Levine, what he wanted to do was to sort of say, well, what Buddhism in the 12 steps is great, but what if we just, what, what if, what if we politely, just politely put the 12 steps aside and just looked at Buddhism? What if we just use Buddhism to recover from addiction? Would that actually work? Mm-hmm. And, um, and he wrote the book Refuge Recovery, and and he kind of landed in this core Buddhist idea of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path, which, if you look at it, makes a lot of sense. It's basically sort of a treatment plan, and of course, the core of that is meditation. And so he wrote the book, and then we started having meetings, and this nonprofit organization, really, which is the core of what Refuge is, is, is a way for people to, you know, like, so you live in Calgary, or somebody lives in Des Moines, Iowa, and they want to meditate as part of the recovery, well, there's nowhere for them to go. So the, the point was to start these peer-led meetings where people had a book, uh, they had a program where they could meet much like the 12 steps and use community through a different kind of a lens or a different kind of process uh, to address addiction. And, you know, I think it's so far been a very very great experiment. We'll see where it goes. I think it's going to help a lot of people. And then refuge, you get, you get a whole hotspot of people. You get, you get 12 step people who go, you get people who don't want to go to 12 steps. You know, you go to a refuge recovery meeting, you might have some NA people, some AA people, some Al-Anon people. It just, what, what refuge did, I think that was brilliant is it removed the symptomology it's yeah. actually not about drugs or alcohol. It's about the fact that there's something about my life that's so hard that I need to engage in destructive behaviors to medicate myself. Yeah. So it, it comes at it from a much different angle. And I think that, you know, with the, with the also with the science around addiction and mindfulness, it's, um, I think it's going to help a lot of people. It's not for everybody. You know, it's not going to work for everybody. It's just like AA is not for everybody. And I, I just think there needs to be more options that don't, you know, treatment centers, right? Twenty thousand bucks a month, like, you know, you know, how many drug addicts get twenty thousand dollars tucked away for treatment? So it, it's another way in which people can go out into the community, get some recovery support without having to break out their checkbook or credit card. Yeah, yeah, especially how uh, I think what happens with people, and especially nowadays, is alcohol and drugs is is such a tandem sort of issue that you know you go to AA and you can't say you're an addict, and you go to NA and you you know you can't say you're an alcoholic. I mean, not that you can't, but you know a lot of these older groups, you kind of have to to go along with. uh, Well, you know, you can't really. Yeah, when you go to AA, you should be saying you're you're an alcoholic, and and, uh, yeah. And so, huh. so, but refuge, you're just, you're, whatever your addiction is, like this is, it's all you can talk about, whatever you want. And there's no, you don't say anything behind your name. It's very, 
non-dogmatic and open and you do your little meditation and then you're sharing. So, so I, was, I mean, what was it like seeing a, a new program like that develop and grow? I mean, it must've been pretty interesting having helped so many people. Right it was after interesting. That. You know, it was interesting. It was also a little bit strange because I was kind of, you know, I, I, you know, I, we started talking about it seven years ago. So, you know, it got to a point where actually when it started to catch on and become popular, I was in, in a weird sort of way, almost tired of it. You know, and um, because I put so much time and so much energy into it, you know, so I mean, I'm I'm really happy that it's going strong, and I feel grateful to have been somebody who's been able to really help it. But you know, you know, Noah Levine really did the most of the heavy lifting, and he wrote the book and was able to use his popularity as a teacher and as a guy in recovery to really get things started. So, you know, I'm doing less and less with it nowadays, mostly because I feel like it's standing on its own. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I was the executive director for the nonprofit for some, for about a year and mm -hmm. kind of got it to a good place, but that wasn't a really great fit for me. It was not something I had a lot of experience with. So it's kind of like, you know, I feel like it's kind of, you know, out there, it kind of, it's kind of walking on its own. So I'm curious to keep an eye on it. And, um, uh, I think it's going to help a lot of people. And so I, I feel, I feel really, really good about that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you mentioned how the, you know, the recovery rate has been, dismal in society since you know since a started in the 30s or whatever i mean i don't know we you know i don't know the stat the stats of how it's gone up and down but i would think it would be improving especially like you said with all these tools and and different programs and processes we have and the education and knowledge but do you think it's it's what's counteracting that is uh all this new stuff like fentanyl and 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 uh you know, all these newer, harder drugs that, I mean, is it, it seems to me like things are even, even since I've been involved in this, been way worse now than they were even five years ago. Yeah, that's right. And I think a couple of things, I think that the world is a more challenging place to live in than it used to be. Mm. So I think people in, think, I think people in general are having a harder time more so than any other time in human history you know, because of the political landscape and the economical landscape. I mean, it, it, it like the world's a, a stressful place. The modern world is, is a hard place to live in. So I think that there's that. So the added stress, you know, would, would, would give rise to the added need for, for taking the edge off, if you will. And I also think the modern delivery system is so advanced now. Oh, it's yes. just so easy. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, you used to have to go like to a bad neighborhood and get it from the dope man yeah. and get ripped off maybe or beat up. Now you just go to the doctor with like a hurt back, you know, and, and like, you know, even like, you know, like if you look at addiction through a broader lens, like you look at sex addiction and porn addiction, you know, like teenagers used to have to steal a penthouse from Seven Eleven, and now it's just one click away on the phone. It's like, so the delivery system for addiction behaviors is just like, you know, it's like McDonald's, dude. It's just like right there for you. So I think the combination of those two things, and I could totally be wrong, but those two things seem to be the big instigators to all of this. No, oh, that's a wonder, really good point. Yeah, I wonder why it seems like um, the places that do go like full decriminalization seem to have better luck, you know what I mean? Because it just seems weird to me. It seems like it's it's hardwired into the human experience almost in some ways. Cause like, it's illegal? like it's, well, no, it's like, it's hard to be alive these days. Sure. And in a lot of ways it is, it's some of the toughest times to be alive, but at the same time, you know, most people have way more people have access to food, water, heat, shelter, the internet, iPhones, all these different social programs, like from, from a lot of different angles, we've got a better even the poorest people in Western society have it a whole lot better than we did, say, well, a thousand no, yeah, years just, ago. Yeah, but just because you think we're technologically more advanced, that doesn't mean that people are doing better. Or, you know, they might be more of a slave than they used to be. You know, they, maybe yeah, they used maybe. to find their food and shelter in other ways, and things were simpler. Now you've got this. It almost, seems like yeah. it, it almost seems like it's the community itself. Like, you could do it with any community. Like not to shortchange this, uh, but like the AA is kind of a community. And with me, it was having kids. So then I had that family sort of unit as a community. And with right. other people, it's you know if they just fall into the right group of friends, they can they can beat something. Oh, they so, do say the connection has it. So, so you're talking about connection. Yeah, but then at the same time, we've got this crazy over socialization of a planet, which doesn't seem to be helping. So it yeah. just seems you know at what level 
I wonder if it refers, it comes back to that 150 number. Yeah. Well, it's also, you know, you're right. That. I think that you're right in the sense that uh, people, you know, ha- that there's, a, there's two things. There's one is there's a lack of connection. I mean, you know, people have 3,000 Facebook friends, but they don't actually have somebody that they can actually talk to face to face, which is why we looked at why the, you know, there's a study that was done about why the 12 steps was so help. Well, why does the 12 steps work? And what they landed in was, it was the community aspect of it. So people don't have the connection that they probably think that they have. And we, and also to using a, a, a more of a Buddhist idea is we've externalized happiness to the point where it, people are so vacant in their inner lives. You know, we've externalized happiness, get the iPhone, get the new car, get the Tesla, get this, get that, that people think that if they get the conditions of their life, you know, really, really looking good on the outside, that they'll be happy. And I think that we've just found out that that that's actually not true. That's why you need to join the not, chats. Because people are finding they're, happiness they're in, in the, the chat. Oh, we have a perpetual chat room. Like it's actually just an app and people are in there all the time chatting with each other. It's sort of building connection and community. Like Two people, people actually, have quit smoking. Yeah. Some people are in recovery. Some yeah. people are quitting drugs. Other people, That's you know, there is, there's, wow. there's like five or six people in our chats that are in the process of quitting something. Wow. Or That's, have recently quit something. That's interesting. Yeah. There's the connection yeah. in the community you're talking about. Yeah. So, so Dave, does that, does that have something to do with, um, you moving from LA to, uh, Colorado then? Well, you know, um, probably, I mean, a couple of things. One is I moved to Los Angeles pretty reluctantly. You know, I, 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 LA is not a kind of place that I ever really wanted to live. And so I moved there mostly because I, I lived in Nashville, Tennessee and I, I wanted, I, I wanted to move and I was going to move to the Bay area which wasn't a great idea. I moved to LA because it was the right thing to do at the time. And I have no regrets about that. But I went there with kind of an idea that I would be there for about two years. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I actually got in a really bad motorcycle accident last year and I almost died. Jesus. So that slowed me down a little bit. So I, I had this very near death experience. And at the time also too, my, my girlfriend and I got together and my friend Shannon, who I had been friends with and involved in teaching meditation for years, uh, we got together and kind of fell in love and were kind of plotting this escape plan of like, where do we want to go? What do we want to do? And I, I had my eyes on Colorado for a long time because my mom and dad are out here and my sister's out here and it's beautiful out here. But, you know, we live in a town with 1,500 people. I, I didn't want to move here when I was single, that was for sure. So, um, you know, there was a whole wide range of reasons to move here that those are some of the big ones but i um i really wanted to get back to nature i wanted to get back i wanted to have some land i i I wanted to get back to a lifestyle that was going to be more conducive to my dharma practice i wanted more spaciousness i didn't want to have to be i didn't want to have to be making the amount of money i needed to make to live in la i also wanted to have a lifestyle that was more ecologically aware you know i didn't want to buy you know 24 plastic cups from Starbucks every week and, you know, live a consumer based lifestyle. I wanted to get some land and and grow buy some of my own food and get chickens. And I really kind of wanted to have a more, a lifestyle that was more in line with being, um, you know, we were building a house and we're looking at solar power. So I just really wanted to, um, yeah, I wasn't feeling good about the amount of consumerism that I took place in. Yeah, that makes sense, man. That's been a trend on the show. Even we've talked about that a lot, you know, your own farming and, you know, growing your own food. I mean, that's also one of the only ways to really stay healthy nowadays is to just do your own thing like that. I mean, you don't know where everything's coming from and there's so much process crap out there. So yeah, that's a, that's a great step. Hey, before I, before I forget to talk about this, cause I think it's a really important part of recovery is the renunciation part about it. You know, like the, cause I mean, you hear in different, different types of programs now and stuff, there's the harm reduction model and this type of thing. And I've always appreciated learning about that. Like something clicked for me that I realized I had to, to give it all up, you know, in a way not play around with this stuff. Do you want to, and I thought that, um, you know, that's kind of the way you thought about it too, from the workshop that you did. I want, do you think you could address that a little bit about why renunciation may be very important? Well, I think renunciation is radically important. And I, and, and the, the problem with renunciation, I think is the word itself. It's not a word that we use every day. So 
So, you know, it, it, it comes from the Buddhist paradigm. Of course, they're not the only people who use it. But there's not a great word that, there's not a great synonym for renunciation. So, in, in, in the schema of abstinence, even that's kind of a charged word. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. abstinence, renunciation. Um, you know, you know, j- just stop, you know, like it didn't work for Nancy Reagan was talking about abstinence in the eighties and that didn't work. Just say no. So, you know, it's, so I just want to say that, that abstinence is a big setup right out of the gate. So it's important to kind of unpack it a little bit, I think. And so when we look at like, um, the Buddhist practice, mindfulness practice is that renunciation is part of intention. So it, we have to understand that. Everything in our lives rests on the tip of intention, the tip of motivation. So we, and we don't get it right all the time. So I think what happens with renunciation, to me, renunciation just means not needing anything extra. You know, it it means I'm able to have less. I can, I can live without drugs and alcohol. You know, I can live without, you know, 24 plastic cups of Starbucks a week or whatever. But what it is, I think that we actually have to come to some place where we can identify the need for that renunciation. And that's a hard one for a lot of people. You know, it's just like, um, it's having, it's making a, it, it's a little bit of a sacrifice, right? It's, it, it, here's what it is actually. It's a little bit of a sacrifice. It's making a choice to do without. But what you're doing actually in, in the paradigm of our culture is you're, you're choosing to do something a little bit better than immediate gratification because we are on immediate gratification culture and even addiction is a process of immediate gratification. Renunciation is kind of taking a high road that says, you know what, I'm going to deal with the stress and the tolerance of not getting this thing right now because I'm looking for long-term results. So it's renunciation is kind of about seeing the big picture and it's about making small sacrifices one small sacrifice at a time, so that way you're heading into a different direction, which is ultimately about creating a lifestyle. You know, a lifestyle that supports genuine happiness and recovery and your core values. And it, it does, there's a rub to it because it means you're kind of going to have to do without, you know, the bowl of ice cream and the Netflix at 11 p.m., or you're going to have to do without, you know, you're, you're, there's a sacrifice to be made in renunciation, and people don't like that. Wait, how come how come I'm losing the ice cream here? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You don't like that. I was just giving an example of something I knew you weren't going to want to hear. <laughs> No, but there's a there's a deeper reason as well. I believe there's a you could unpack a little bit more even to say that there's a physical trigger. Like if I, you know, and you hear that from people relapsing all the time, right? Is I thought it would be okay. I just wanted one, and then sure enough, that one turns into you know it might take a day or a few days or a couple of weeks or a few months, but inevitably you go back there. That's right. Yeah, and so that's the other side of the coin that I didn't get to. You're totally right about that. Is that we have to see the danger in the not not renunciation. You know, we have to we have to we have to have a healthy level of respect for the danger of what will happen to us if we don't practice renunciation. You know, so it's a little bit of that AA like cost benefit analysis, you know, analogy that they throw around sometimes. So again, it's like looking looking at the big picture, seeing reading the tape through and saying like, you know what, I can manage this trigger or I'm going to choose this is why mindfulness is so good. It helps you manage in the present time when you're feeling like you want to use or you feel triggered or whatever word you want to throw at it. It allows you to get through that experience without actually having to pick up the destructive behavior. So, you know, you could say mindfulness is your best friend when it comes to renunciation. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It kind of, it kind of fits in yeah, with the, cra- the craving part as well. So we had this guest on, uh, a little while back and he was talking about, he was living in Japan. I think he was an American and he was learning about Buddhism and he was learning at it from a different ah, Ricard. side. Yeah. Ricard. And he, he had a different view of um, Buddhism. He says that it's, it's been, it's been translated differently in some of our Asian cultures. And, and the main thing is Bono, which is your fear, I guess is, is a uh, fear holds you back from living and you should be walking and, downtown and in women's underwear. That and was, <laughs> that was the moral of the story. <laughs> the moral of the story was, you know, that holds you back. And that if you can attack your fear, 
um, then that's how the happiness starts. And he had a whole bunch of different examples of how he has been through, you know, when, when he sees the fear, when he feels the fear, he attacks it and he gets through all these things. And, and really that's where your spiritual growth and happiness comes from. And now put, you know, whether that's a, I wanted to get your opinion on that as far as like a Buddhist principle, this is, if it's something that you've, you've learned or approached or heard about, and then on the other side of that, is that a healthy way to approach recovery? Because it could it could end up, you know, backfiring a little bit in, in, in recovery if you're dealing with addiction and, and trying to face fears too early and, and you're, you know, in your, on your journey. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Well, first of all, there's, there's a little bit of a problematic aspect to what you're saying. And it's, a, first of all, the problematic nature of this word Buddhism, because there's so many kinds of Buddhism um, you know, and so this this is one perspective that this guy's talking about. Now, uh, that's nothing that I've ever been, been familiar with or ever heard of before, of this bono or this fear thing uh, in early Buddhism, which is more my my practice is what would be called the Theravadan school, or what I just call early early Buddhism, which is going back to the original source. Fear doesn't play a big role in that. I think that fear is so primal that I think that from my perspective. Fear is sort of benign in the sense of fear is not wholesome or unwholesome. That fear is actually quite necessary mm-hmm. and is also quite problematic. You know, if you had no fear, you'd walk in front of a bus tomorrow. Uh, so you can have, I think it's a middle way. You can have too much fear and you can have not enough fear. Mm-hmm. So again, is fear a tool or is it a weapon? Well, you need to you and, learn uh, to rationalize between fear and danger, right? I think that's uh, you got me saying right, Dunlap. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I don't know. I think that you know, fear is um, something that we have to come to terms with. It's not going anywhere, uh, but we have to. And we're also different, you know. I mean, the, the big book talks about fear being this corrosive thread that you know the fabric of our existence is shot through with it. So you know, fear definitely is, is a big factor in in suffering or a big factor in recovery, but. Um, I think there's a, a multiple, multiple ways that you can address fear, and I think that everybody's a little bit different. So I think we have to have some self knowledge and have done some inventory around our fears before we can start trying to come up with antidotes on how to manage our fear. Yeah, that's a good point. So where do you see addiction and going in the next, uh, or addiction treatment, helping it out in the next 10, 20 years or so? Like, is there, is there hope that it's going to get, that we're going to break through something and, and, and even like our respect for this will change as we grow up in society. And maybe it's, it's, you know, these dangers are treated differently as when we're younger. Yeah, I really don't know. I mean, I'm very curious. I'm, I'm interested in addiction as a phenomenon. You know, for me personally, I'm going down the route of a more of an emotional intelligence approach. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm working with uh, one of my friends, Eve Ekman, uh, who has a whole system for training around uh, what she calls cultivating emotional balance. Mm. And I, I, my, my experience personally, like if I'm honest about my, my suffering, uh, the area in my life that I still find the most challenge is my emotional life. Um, I'm pretty happy physically, mentally. I feel like my attitude's good. I don't really engage in too many behaviors that seem problematic. But the, the area of my life that's still hard for me are my emotions. And I think that when you look at addiction treatment and you look at people in early recovery, what makes it so hard is emotions. And I don't think that we've developed or offered a framework or a set of practices that really allow people to A, get a good education about emotions, what they are, how they work, and what we can expect, and also B, a type of contemplative practice or a mind-body awareness practice where people basically learn how to access and manage emotions. I think that that's a missing piece and that that's kind of the direction that I'm heading in. Yeah, and it doesn't help that we're over-prescribed. And whenever you go somewhere with an emotional problem, you get... Uh you know, some sort of drug prescribed to you, which I think is part of the, well, that's, part, that's, of the part of the main the problem. problem. Yeah. 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 I have, I have, I have an addiction lecture that I give called a war on emotions. And I think as a culture and a society, we've declared war against emotions, against difficult emotions and difficult mind states. So if I'm sad, there's something wrong with me. 
and I need to go get the sadness fixed. <laughs> and that's the whole problem. That's the whole, that's the whole reason people get addicted in the first place. You know, there are emotions. They're not going anywhere. You're going to get sad. You're going to get angry. You're going to have fear. You're going to have contempt and disgust and shame. Uh, you know, they're hardwired into our evolutionary system. So we have to learn how to manage and balance and work with emotions, not medicate them. Yeah, that's a great point. So, so that brings us to like the, what you're doing right now for work. You're doing, um, you're doing your some personal development with people as well as still um, teaching meditation and doing workshops and stuff like that. You want to talk about how you're putting this this into practice to help people this emotional intelligence approach? Yeah, I mean that's basically what I do every day. I try to figure out what it is that I'm doing. So I mean I. <laughs> You know, I, I also want to say first and foremost that I do consider myself a student, you know, of all these practices. And I, I'm doing a lot of training this year and I'm sitting a lot of retreats. And, uh, you know, I, I also feel like part of what I do is my own process. And I'm I'm not done yet, dude. I'm not recovered. I'm, you know, I'm in process still. But what I, what I do is, you know, I teach mindfulness. I teach Buddhist retreats. So I teach three-day, five-day, seven-day silent retreats around the country, wow. uh, different places. That's, that's, that's a big part of what I do. I also do one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and I, I do it over Skype and FaceTime, and I have students that I meet with every two weeks for 30 minutes, people who want to start, develop, and maintain a daily meditation practice, and I, and I coach people through that. Um, I also, you know, I also provide training uh, basically like emotional intelligence and mindfulness trainings for various mental health agencies or substance abuse treatment. I was just in Salt Lake last week doing a training for this really great program called Recovery Ways in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, so I'm trying to do collaborations with programs, with programs that are already doing, that are actually good programs, mm -hmm. who just want to integrate some of the stuff that I teach into their program. So, so I really kind of a, a Swiss Army knife in all of this. Um, and I also, I get bored easy, so I, I, I can't just do one thing. I, I, I like to do mentoring and I like to speak and I like to do training and I like to do consulting and I, I just like collaborating and think with people. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do a lot of different things, A, cause I need to, and B, because I just like doing different things, you know? So I'm, uh, I'm excited about the stuff that I, that I get to do. And I'm, I feel grateful that my, that my recovery has sort of put me into this weird career where I like do all these great things. Uh, and mostly what I do is I teach people what I've done, you yeah. know, and, and I kind of land in that big book analogy of, you know, you can't transmit something that you don't have. Yeah. So I, I just, I only, I really only offer people what I, what I have found to be true and useful for myself. And, and I do have a course of kind of a, nerdy uh, background in academic Buddhism and I do study early Buddhism in a way that's probably a little bit academic. So I, I do, I'm kind of a, you know, a wealth of, um, of knowledge that not everybody's interested in, you know, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's kind of where that goes. What is your, what does your daily sitting practice look like? Or, or even if it is daily, sorry, I shouldn't even assume it's daily, but. Well, you know, it's, it, it changes a lot. I do a lot of things that I, I do a lot of hiking and walking and I do a lot of practices that wouldn't, wouldn't be considered traditional. Yeah. But as far as sitting practice goes, basically what I've done for the last couple of years, uh, is I, I sit at least three times a week. Uh, I sit for one hour. I do these one hour meditations where I do kind of a whole bunch of reflective practices using, uh, kind of, I don't even know, like kind of not technique, technique um, <laughs> that are more, more, they're more intuitive practices and kind of more about my own process. But I do, I do sit for, for, you know, at least three hours a week that way. And then I'll sit for 20 minutes here, 30 minutes there. And I teach a lot. So if I'm teaching, I'm meditating a lot. So um, I wouldn't say that I sit every day, um, but I do engage and, and, and you know, so it just gets strange after a while. Like what is me it's the point like, well, what is meditation anyway now? So, yeah. but I do have, I do have a sitting practice and I do sit retreats. I'm, I'm sitting three, one week retreats this year and doing some training. So I'm getting back more back into my student domain. Um, and I feel pretty good about that and curious to see what's going to happen next, you know? Nice. Is there anything you think uh, that we left out that's important for people to know before we wrap it up? 
I mean, you know, you can, you know, some shameless self-promotion, but also just to let people know, um, you know, I do have some free resources. I, I, if you go to iTunes, I have a podcast oh, on that's iTunes right, yeah. called Rebel Saint Dharma, and you can just go to podcast and subscribe. It's free, and it has the different talks that I've given and some meditations on there. Uh, so, And also I have a website called Rebel Saint Dharma, which has my schedule. Uh, if you're interested in kind of coming to sit with me or see what I'm up to, you can see my, my schedule for the years up there. And also you can find out the res- or the services that I offer if you're interested in having me mentor or come speak. or uh, So you can kind of find out what I'm doing at rebelsaintdharma.com. Right on, Dave. Thanks so much for coming on and talking about this. I've really wanted to do like a full sort of show on, on recovery and dig into it a little bit. Um, like I said, we've got some, some listeners here that have been through it in the last couple of years and more seem to be, to be quitting things. So I think it's appropriate timing for this and really appreciate your time uh, getting into all this and being so honest and, and open. Oh, no, absolutely, man. I'm always happy to talk about these things. It's, uh, it's my primary interest. So I, I appreciate that. Um, that we got a chance to meet in Calgary when I was up there and hopefully we'll be back at some point. And, um, yeah. And just, you know, anything, if anybody finds any of our conversation useful or helpful, then, you know, that's, uh, that's the whole reason we do this stuff is to try to try to be a service and be helpful to other people. So hopefully that, hopefully that some of that has arisen as our time here, uh, on the phone tonight. Oh, for sure. You bet. All right, Dave. Yeah, Thanks, man. Dave. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right. We'll catch you guys later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. That was a chat with Dave Smith, Refuge Recovery. What'd you Buddhist. think of that? Good. Yeah? Yeah, it's good. Did any of it resonate with you at all? Uh, the mindfulness aspect? Yeah, or? some of it. Yeah. I don't know. I seem to not grapple with those demons as much as some people. I mean, well, I you, you quit nicotine. Quite weed, I but I quit know. nicotine and, uh, you know... And drinking, you don't drink as much anymore, but you didn't, really you weren't really all, in that. But those are all just things I just kind of decided Yeah, on my own, you know, yeah. I just, just enough is enough. But a lot of it is my kids. I, when I have my kids, I quit drinking. What and then when my kids ask me to quit smoking, I quit smoking. What about this thing? This chronic the dope weed? I don't think I'll quit smoking. No. I, mean, I don't see it happening. No. Would you ever cut it down, cut it back at all? Maybe. Yeah. Go like a week and just see how you feel. With when you and then when you I take feel care, annoyed <laughs> mostly with you <laughs> right now. <laughs> no, so you would feel annoyed. when I'm at work, not still. So that's, <laughs> that's your coping mechanism <laughs> when I get home. I have yeah. to relax from all the gramisms at work. Oh boy, are you blaming me? I eh? just throwing that, like, yeah. just pointing yeah. that, pointing yeah. that finger. Eh? It's all Graham's fault. <laughs> Anyway, big thanks to Dave Smith for coming to the show. If you guys need some help, there's a place to go. Yeah, all the start. links will anyway. be in the show notes for Dave's work. And clearly yeah. it's proven that the chats can help. So maybe if you just want to see right. if you have a problem, go in the chats and we'll let you know if you have a problem. And we'll <laughs> help you deal with it. So that's what we do. Yeah, and check out his podcast too. I listened to the last four or five. It was pretty good. Like he's got meditations in there. So if people want to just take that, like you can almost take the four foundations of mindfulness, right? Just listening to his podcast. There you have it. And of course, check out America.ca slash support, guys, so we can keep doing this shit. Keep us, keep the bills paid, keep the heat on. Winter's coming. It gets cold. Needs heat. Not cheap. Um, so yeah, check out America.ca slash support, guys. If you're getting some value for the show, do throw some value back our way. Um, yeah, you know, that we're, helps. We're Couldn't do it without you. Closing in on 250 apps here real quick. Not including the bonus apps. Not including the bonus apps and the apps you get for being a supporter. There's more in there. And uh, we did it all for free. So throw a little value our way, motherfuckers. It helps. It really does. It does, yeah, for sure. Helps. And Libsyn just adjusted their stats. The numbers are all down. So a couple subscribers help us feel a little better. Yeah, exactly. Talk us back from the edge of the cliff. Oh, it doesn't matter about the numbers. It does if they stop listening all together. <laughs> yeah, <for laughs> sure. Mind you, we get away no, with no, no, more we're shit not, we get, We're getting more listeners. Are we? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. Share the show, motherfuckers. Thanks for listening. See you next week. You fuss and you fight and when you come around, won't be enough. Well, come on and get me. I'm homesick and I'm bored.
Another adventure in coffee enemas. Oh man. Oh, oh, God. oh my God. I gotta get the washroom. Okay, okay. Almost there. Oh, one more step. Okay. Oh God. I just gotta get these pants off. Oh, it's here. <laughs> It's over. Oh, thank God. It's over. Well, all right then. What is this? What is this I feel inside of me? All this, all this power. All this invigorating energy. I, I, I feel like I can arm wrestle a moose. I gotta get going. I gotta move. I gotta run. Oh my God. Spam Graham, Graham, 